Okay, it's me. I'm on. Hello. Welcome to the special special meeting of the City Council, uh, the City Council Committee on Finance and the Northampton City Council. We're having a public hearing um, on the budget today. Um, and um, I'd like to I call asked the government Zoom to start video and unmute, but so far it hasn't done that. I'm not sure who has control of that. <laughs> so are we oh, live? I think Do I get should to be that over? <laughs> yeah. There you go. There we go. Oh. Okay. Good. 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 Uh -oh. Start again. Okay. Hello. Take two. <laughs> it's right. not me. I'm muted. A uh, stand. You have to turn your iPad off. is unmuted. There's a lot to think about. Okay, welcome to the special meeting of the City Council on Tuesday, May 23rd, 2023. Uh, tonight we are having budget hearings and uh, I'd like to uh, call the Council to uh, together. Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Elkin. Here. Councillor Foster. Here. Councillor Gore. Here. Councillor Jarrett. Here. <laughs> Councillor Labarge. Here. Councillor Maori. Here. Councillor Moulton. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. And Councillor Perry. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Well, we, oh, I'm sorry. we have. President. <laughs> we're getting this right. Yes, yeah, so yeah. Council is now convened, and Council will now recess for finance. And is that all we need to do, Laura? Okay. So Councilor Mayori is going to be okay. chairing. Well, yeah. So welcome to the May 23rd public hearing on the budget, uh, the 2024 Northampton budget. Uh, I'm Rachel Mayori, chair of the Finance Committee. And next to me is Councilor Barge, the vice chair. Um, you are being audio and video recorded. And um, I believe we need to open, uh, entertain a vote to open the we need to open we call the roll of finance roll. we usually do yeah, yeah. okay yeah. let's do okay. that and then I'll say a few more things <laughs> Councillor Mayori here Councillor Labarge here Councillor Moulton here and Councillor Nash here oh, here uh, so this is a public hearing public hearings are for uh, you the com you know our community members and the rules of a public hearing dictate that all comments really need to be pertinent to the topic at hand, and that means um, about the proposed budget before us. There's a lot that goes on in a city budget, so the way we're breaking it down is that we're going to have department heads give presentations, probably with the mayor's input, and then we'll pause. We'll hear clarifying questions from finance committee members, then clarifying questions from the rest of council, and then we will entertain public comments and questions from, from um, our community. Those comments should be three minutes, and um, then we will uh, keep track. Councilor Moulton has graciously volunteered to make a running list of questions, and so the, all the questions the public have should be directed to the finance committee. And then we will be writing them down and then we will in turn direct them to the appropriate department head or, or the mayor. And then after all that, if there's still comments or questions, we can do another round of public comments. And so what you'd want to do if, you, if you're in the public and you've already made a comment but want to make another one, is that you will get back in the queue, either raising a virtual hand or if you're in person you can sign up here and then we'll go back down the list for a second um, round if we if need be but um, hope hopefully that some of the counselor questions will um, will answer some of the public's questions the other thing for counselors is that at this point we are really only asking clarifying questions we're not really deliberating okay so let's get started um, on our list first we have uh, central services. Oh, excuse me. Open the public oh, yes, we need to open motion. it. Right. We've opened the finance committee, but not the hearing. So, entertain. motion to open the public hearing. <coughs> Second it. Okay. okay. So, call? Yes. No. <laughs> Councillor Elkins. Oh, uh, no, no, it's only finance. finance. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. That's okay. We've done <laughs> it. Haven't done it for a while. I'm not here. <laughs> 
Yes. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. <laughs> yes, we're here, I guess. Okay, now that the public hearing is open, we will go through our um, department heads. Just for the public, I'll let you know that tonight we're talking to Central Services, then Northampton Fire Rescue, then Department of Public Works, and then Health and Human Services. Um, so we will start off with Central Services, which is Director Pat McCarthy. Good evening. Councilor, hey, Councilor Mayori. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, before, before we do that, I do need to make a, uh, uh, a statement. Uh, so um, Pedal People has a contract with Central Services. So as a member of the Pedal People Cooperative, I can't participate in the item due to a conflict of interest um, because of this pre-existing contract. So I'll be turning off my video uh, and audio. And then at the end, uh, I may pop in back in the end of the Central Services item. I may pop back in if I have specific questions that are unrelated to that contract. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, you're, you're on, uh, Director. Thank you. My name's Pat McCarthy. I'm the Director of Central Services. So nice to meet you all in person. Uh, Central Services Department oversees grounds, maintenance, heating, cooling, ventilation, plumbing, electrical, security, fire, fire detection, protection, custodial, renovations, and construction operations, and capital programs for the city and school building. Central Services maintains approximately 792,000 square feet of facilities, including City Hall, Olchaski Municipal Building we're in now, Memorial Hall, <coughs> Station, Main and Florence Fire Station, the Senior Center, James House, the Academy of Music, six schools in the Northampton Public District and the Department of Public Works facilities. Some of the highlights of our uh, successes in fiscal year 23 is the completion of the roundhouse parking lot, the completion of the main fire department rear parking lot expansion, uh, the installation of a new ERV ventilation system for the DPW admin building up on Locust Street, and um, uh, Finally, the completion and delivery and installation of new uh, department copiers, which took a couple of years, um, and upgrades to the JFK uh, EMS system, which is Johnson Controls. And uh, looking forward to uh, fiscal year 24, we are actually going to be entering the sixth and final year of uh, EMS upgrades at JFK. Um, we'll be working on ventilation and greenhouse gas reductions work at Leeds and Jackson Street School. Um, we have the Academy of Music Phase 2 sprinkler uh, project. Code, very important code upgrades to the city elevators. Um, a memori memorial hall rear roof. Uh, some repairs to the senior center windows and floors. And uh, most importantly to me, exterior envelope repairs at City Hall, Academy of Music, James House, and Memorial Hall. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll be initiating full plans and specs for the Gare Garage guardrails on the fifth floor. That completes my uh, presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to just look. Uh, I'm going to look at finance committee members. Any? Oh, yes. Um, go ahead. Sir. Yeah. All right. Welcome, director. Thank you. All right. Um, so I, I I was comparing this year's proposed budget with last year's, and I saw that um, there's two new lines. So one's called standby pay, and the other is out of class. Does this uh, that um, that I, I just noticed that those were different yep. in, in yes yeah, can you called, explain I, I what those are I mentioned that in my presentation that uh, central services is looking forward to hiring one new project manager that's a new line I'm on the payroll right. um, which we're looking forward to uh, the outer class is um, It's uh, an augmentation to someone's salary who is doing someone else's work, if I explain that correctly. Uh, so presently we have uh, uh, the maintenance foreman who is actually getting um, some of the um, 
facilities uh, program coordinators uh, pay. Mm -hmm. And that's what that is. It's a small amount of money. The uh, standby pay is on call pay. Central Services, is, um, to my knowledge, has never gotten on call pay. Mm -hmm. So now we have alternating one week uh, with two people being on call uh, 24 hours a day. And, and a follow-up question, which is, and, and you mentioned the project coordinators. You have two of them now? Uh, or that's the goal. You you, ha yeah, that's you the have goal, right? one have one. One's yes. a vacancy, and, and so that's that's a new addition to. I, I mean, as I was looking at it, it looks like there's been a little reorgan reorganizing with Chris Mason leaving, mm -hmm. and then um, and so what are you hoping to get out of these two new coordinator positions? There's one new coordinator. Who, one right who, now. We hope to be interviewing next month, and hopefully we'll start July first. Um, I'm hoping to get more accomplished. Uh, basically, one project facilitator um, is, it's a little bit overwhelming when we think about some of the net zero improvements we need to make. Uh, there's going to be a, a huge need for, you know, project oversight, writing plans and specs for jobs, coordinating uh, contractors and overseeing the construction. So uh, just adding one more would really improve our accomplishments for the year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so on call pace yep. um, was uh, something that was negotiated as part of the collective bargaining this year with um, NAPIA. So there are three departments that um, you will see that under their lines. Okay. okay. I think Jim had brought up the issues that I had concerns with the two vacancies on the project coordinator and the custodian mm -hmm. on a vacancy. We That's have at the police, the is that at the police department? Yes, and we have filled that position. And that that's position. full time? Yes. That person started about okay. six weeks ago maybe. Also too, on your trash removal? Mm-hmm. I see on Central Service it's 35000 and then on parking maintenance Correct. it is 45000 which comes up to $80,000. What areas does it cover? All the schools on that, picking yeah, the up the trash? And, and uh, all the, you know, the downtown campus, uh, all, all the buildings like the police department, Main Fire, Florence Fire. Um, uh, we may have, I think, yeah, Lily Library. I think Forbes takes care of their own. So mostly so all everywhere. the buildings? Yes. Okay. Yes. When is that contract up? Uh, actually, uh, the end of next month. And we're actually putting that out to bid right now. And when you go out to bid, how do you do that? Do you advertise it or what? Yes. Yes. We follow the uh, municipal procurement rules. So, uh, you know, uh, putting the, the invitation to bid on the combis, um, on the website, uh, in the local newspaper, and also reaching out to, you know, making phone calls to, you know, vendors we know that do waste removal. Just seeing who we have now, I mean, the trash is always picked up, it's clean, and it's something to really look at. Thank you. Um, all right, is there any other questions from finance or other counselors? Any remote counselors? Seems like we don't have any. Um, and are there, I, I don't see any um, hands from the public either. No. Nope. So I will say thank you very much, Director. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for joining thank us. You. Yeah. Okay. So. Next up, we have um, Northampton Fire Rescue, Chief John Davin. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, Councilors. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. Oh, I have this on. Still on Councilor Nash. I think I took over right before COVID started, so it's the first in-person one I've done in three years. So wow. Very <laughs> exciting. Um, so I'm just going to talk about our department a little bit. Last year is a kind of a recap for last year. We had the busiest year in the department's history, so we did about 8,300 and change for calls. Uh, averaged about 24, 25 calls a day. 
Uh, so it was a pretty pretty busy year for us. Um, we are also very busy. You know, we've had um, a shortage of paramedics around the country, uh, especially out here in Western Massachusetts. Uh, so our EMS mutual aid was very busy last year also. Uh, so we went out of town quite a bit, 436 times. So that's, uh, you know, that's pretty significant for our department. Um, we were pretty uh, successful with a bunch of grants this year, last year. So we were able to replace a lot of our uh, damaged fire hose. So we have, you know, small hose all the way up to very big hose. And every year we're, by uh, standard, we're required to test that hose. And this year, unfortunately, uh, some of it's probably 20, 25 years old. So we lost quite a bit of it this year in hose testing that needed to be replaced. So we were lucky, uh, our training captain uh, worked pretty hard on some grants. So we were able to replace most of that with grants and not having to, uh, to take the money out of the budget, which, with, which was great. Uh, so coming up in uh, next year, or this coming budget year, um, we are adding a, a one position, a fire prevention captain. Uh, so currently in our fire prevention bureau, we only have one captain. Um, but uh, last year in December, uh, the fire service, we were, um, they took the solar code and put it into the fire code. So now we are required to inspect every, uh, every solar installation in the city. So what, what that entails is uh, the contractor will submit the plans. Our, our fire prevention office will review them. If there's changes to, made, to be made, we send those plans back to the contractor. They amend them and then they will send them back. We'll make sure they're, they're good. Uh, we'll issue the permit, they'll install the solar, and then we are required to go out there and inspect it once it's finished. So currently, I just looked before I came over, we have 95 solar applications sitting on the desk right now. So that's 95 more inspections that um, we didn't have previously. Uh, so on top of the solar, we are required to now um, inspect and permit any uh, energy storage system that is one kilowatt or greater. And that's a change from, uh, it was in the past, it was only anything 20 kilowatt or higher. So that's, a, that's another significant addition to our workload. Uh, so we've got, you know, we had those two things from the, uh, from the building code were moved into the fire code. Uh, so that's uh, one of the reasons we're adding another position. Uh, also, you know, as our folks are getting promoted now, um, I think from here on out, every one of our promotions will be, they'll be paramedics, they're captains, but they're also paramedics. So uh, with that paramedic certification, requires them to do their um, paramedic refreshers, they have to attend certain amount of continuing edu education stuff. So that takes them out of the office for you know several days at a time. So when that fire prevention captain is not in the office, inspections aren't getting done. So that that kind of backs us up. Um, so you know, kind of looking at that stuff, and there's um, there's quite a few inspections right now that we we just aren't getting to because we only have the one person in there. For example. Um, Energy, uh, not uh, residents, six families and above. We should be out there inspecting those every year, uh, but we just don't have we don't have the personnel to do it with one person in fire prevention. So you know we need to get back out there and get those done. Uh, we are not currently inspecting restaurants that do not have liquor licenses, right? So your Burger King, your McDonald's, um, you know various places like that that don't have liquor licenses. But we should be out there and inspecting them. And unfortunately, with one person, we just, you know, we can't, we just can't get to them. Uh, so that was another reason that we're adding um, another, another position in there. And, you know, and then I mean, we've all we're all familiar with the Bichem uh, saga that's been going on up in Florence. You know, when uh, our fire prevention officer that took a significant amount of his time. So when he's tied up up there, inspections aren't getting done elsewhere in the city. Uh, so, you know, not only by Cam, you, you know, you look at Bombix the last couple, well, last week or so, you know, we've been tied up, he's been tied up there quite a bit, got a lot of hours and time up there and working on that. So, you know, when they're doing that, there's just, there, there's no time, the other inspections aren't getting done in the city. So the mayor agreed that, you know, it's time we've kind of outgrown um, the office. We need, we need one more person in there. 
Uh, so we'll have two captains in there working days. The office will be covered Monday through Friday. And our plan is to uh, make sure that they don't take vacations at the same time so that uh, we'll always have somebody in the office. And their paramedic refresher, we'll try to get those on alternating years too so that uh, we, we, we have constant coverage in the office uh, without uh, you know, losing them for several days at a time and, and not getting inspections done. So that's really the biggest addition to our budget this year. Um, obviously, uh, we settled the contract with the firefighters union, so you know the raises uh, went into the budget also. Uh, but that's, um, you know, other than that, that's really you know the significant changes, I guess, in the budget. Yes, counselor. Yes, um, chief. Question on that new position, the fire pre prevention position. You have three vacancies. Are you taking one of those vacancies and making that position out of that? No, so we're adding another position. So instead of 68 sworn personnel, we'll have 69 now. I still have three vacancies. So you're increasing your budget, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes, by one, by one captain's position, yes. Yeah, uh, Council Moulton. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Chief. Um, I, I too have a question about the new uh, fire prevention position. You mentioned 95 solar applications on your desk, which sounds to me like quite a bit. Uh, you also are now going to be required to inspect so, uh, energy storage systems one kilowatt or greater as opposed to 20. 20. 20. So that's going to add some workload. Correct. Uh, and, and I guess my question is, is there any specialized knowledge for for those two kinds of inspections that is beyond what a, a typical fire prevention officer would have? And so do you anticipate being able to, to fill that new position fairly quickly? Yes, so there is, that's a great question. There is specialized training. Uh, so our fire prevention captain, Mark Curtin, he's retiring actually next week, he's retiring. Uh -huh. Uh, so he was required to go through uh, training provided by the Department of Fire Services uh, to learn how you know the systems work and how to inspect them and permit them. Uh, but we also, um, so another exciting news, we're promoting our first uh, female captain in the history of the department. Mm. So when Mark retires on June 2nd, uh, firefighter Natalie Stolmeyer is going to be promoted to captain and she is going to be Mark's replacement in fire prevention. So she was also sent to the training. And then uh, the next person, the next firefighter on the list is Eric Toya. So he will take that second position in uh, fire prevention and he was also sent to the training. So we have, we'll have all three of them have the training and they'll be ready to go. Okay, so you've already, you've yes. already anticipated that yes. and they've all gone through that specialized training. Great, Correct. thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Yes, Councilor Nash. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, more on that uh, that new position. So, in, are in, are there inspection fees that go that might help pay for this position? Yes, we do. Yes, we do charge. It's fifty dollar fee for the inspection. Correct. So there will be so part of the additional cost will be balanced out, or um, yeah, I would say I'd defer that to Charlene. But yeah, so those ninety five inspections, fifty dollars each that we wouldn't have had previous. Correct. Okay. Oh, that's good. All right. And um, and <coughs> the, this is, uh, I'm just curious as to your thoughts as to why we're inspecting um, solar, or solar arrays for fire. I mean, it makes sense if it's a heating system where there's gas or, you know, no. or oil. This is a <coughs> basically a battery charger on the roof. Correct. And... Um, <coughs> Uh, maybe I'm naive. Is the, is no, the it's that's another great question, and I think I think the mayor had the same question. Um, so the reason it got moved to the fire code, um, and not to get too too deep into the weeds, but a tactic, one of our tactics in fighting fires, mm -hmm. is we we always go to the roof, and depending on the size of the fire location, uh, we cut a hole in the roof to ventilate. Right, heat, smoke goes up. Wow. You know, firefighters can come in, put the fire out. Um, so what's happening is, you know, they've been allowing these solar contractors to cover the entire roof with solar.
solar panels and we have lost our access to the roof. So the new solar code is uh, mandates that they leave a three foot path in between panels so that the fire, fire service will have access so we can get to that roof and cut that hole if we need to. So that's why it got moved over to our side because they were literally covering the entire roof with panels and we lost our access and we could no longer cut holes in the roof. So, so, it, so if you have a shedded roof, mm -hmm. this side, can you cover this side entirely with panels and then the other side? As long, well, I mean, it's, it's a cake, that's the, and that's what is taking the time. <laughs> Right, so our, a lot of times the fire prevention captain has to go out there and actually look at the roof and say, okay, show me what you plan to do here. And then they'll have a conversation and we'll say, okay, you know, this is what you're gonna do, but we, they have to at least give us that three foot path. Right, so it, it's kind of individual looking at each, each roof, right. you know, the way it, they're gonna set the panels up. But that's why it got moved over to the fire side because yeah. we were losing access to the roof. That explains it, yeah. thank you. And all of the other details. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was curious. Yep. That's the reason. <laughs> right. Vice Chair Labarge, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay, I'm all set. Anyone else? Uh, counselors? I don't see any questions. I, uh, oh. I actually, I just, I, I just, more a like question, comment. So um, last year, 400 calls for mutual aid, um, or the year before. This year was 436, mm -hmm. then 400, and this seems to be a, an, a, a, an ongoing trend here. I, was, I looked through my budget books going back to 2018 and didn't see you know, the data on mutual aid, right. but um, are these numbers you know, way different post-COVID, you know, since the pandemic? They are, you know, we were for some reason, you know, since the pandemic, and I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with, you know, uh, the things that were going on with law enforcement, right? We weren't being able to recruit police officers. Well, I think the fire service has kind of gotten lumped in there too, and people just aren't getting into public safety careers. Um, you know, I think one of the cool things we've done is started a, an internship with Smith Vocational. So we're trying to get some local kids that are interested in becoming a firefighter and kind of give them a path. Um, we just got the uh, Smith folk just agreed to run an EMT class for the students up there, which is amazing. Uh, so we're hoping that we can, you know, we'll get these kids interested in the career, you know, move them into an EMT class, and from there, hey, here we go. We're going to roll you right into paramedic school and you know, bring you on board and hopefully get some good, some good local kids involved. Um, but, you know, obviously that's, you know, a year or so out, but uh, we've had some really great interns from Smith Vogue. They're really interested in the program, so we're hopeful. We're hopeful that we're going to, it's going to help the recruiting. You know, we have three vacancies right now, and I think we had, I think we had 20 applicants. Uh, I think we interviewed 12, and we're going to move five of them forward. And when I came on in 1998, there was 200 and something people behind me on the list. So now I'm getting maybe 20. Mm -hmm. So it's just, uh, and it's not just us. You know, the, the pay is great, the benefits are great in the city. We're not the only ones. Everybody is struggling. And more so on departments that run an ALS ambulance with, that need paramedics. You know, if we didn't run the ambulance, I think our recruiting would be a little bit easier because you're not requiring that, that paramedic, that two-year paramedic school. But um, unfortunately, you know, we, we run both, so. <coughs> We've gone to, we've kind of started hiring folks that are enrolled in paramedic school. Uh, we're trying to get folks that are like a, a, a year through it already, and then we just make it a, uh, um, a condition of their employment that they have to finish their paramedic school and they have to pass and get their certificate. Um, so yeah, we've actually been hiring basic EMTs that are in school. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, and, and it's, it's a cost though, right? Uh, if they have paramedic school and they're working tonight on shift and they have four hours of class, we have to give them the time off so that they can go to school. And, you know, sometimes that creates overtime. So I have to, you know, pay to backfill those folks. But we're hoping, you know, get some good young people and, and invest in them, teach them our system. And uh, hopefully we'll keep them. 
Well, and just one more. I, so I noticed the numbers since uh, 2018. It, it was roughly 7,000 to 7,300 calls, and then we hit the pandemic, and it's another 1,000 per year. And with these, this mutual aid, you know, that's, you know, I, I just know during contract negotiations that there was a lot of concern about the, the workload that the, oh, yeah. that fire rescue was taking on, and a lot of it had to do with providing this mutual right. aid. Yeah, and, and there's a cost to that mutual aid, right? It's wear and tear on our vehicles, it's fuel, right? And it's, you know, it's more work, it's more EMS supplies that we didn't budget for. Right, so when you you know when you go out of town four hundred something times, that that's a. I mean, obviously we're billing, right? We're we're billing the patient, but still, it's a cost that you really can't budget for because, you know, you never know. It could be four hundred next year. It could be eight hundred. You know, we don't really know. Um, so it's it's kind of that it's unknown something out we're, there. We're, we do it because yeah, I it's mean, the right thing to yeah, do. Yeah, and, and honestly, the the the, the rules around EMS. State that you know if we have some, an ambulance available, we're supposed to send it. Right. So I mean, we you know we'll go we go to Conway, Huntington. I mean, we're all over the place. I, I guess that the point I'm trying to make is that the um, the workload oh, yeah. has it's a regional issue. It is, and it that in in some in a lot of it's out of, of our control. Yeah, I mean East Hampton's in the same boat. You know, they're down in Holyoke a couple times a day, three four times a day sometimes mutual aid down there and you know we're kind of handling you know the this side of the river and going up into Franklin County Deerfield stuff like that so it's everybody well, thank you you okay I see um, Councillor Perry and then Councillor Jarrett yes thank you um, thank you Chief Davin for your presentation and for your hard work I'm sorry I can't be there in person for your first time in front of the chamber and the council. Um, but I, I had a, a question. You said that you currently aren't inspecting restaurants without a liquor license. Correct. Um, and I was just wondering what the backlog is on that and um, you know whether or not this position will help you plow through that or you know where, where we are with that. No, that's a good question, Council. There is a backlog. Um, I know uh, Captain Kurt was trying when he had some free time, he was trying to get out into some of these restaurants and, and just do a quick kind of check up to see kind of where they are. And because if you, th if you think about it, right, so like your McDonald's and stuff, uh, they need their hoods inspected, fire alarm systems are supposed to be inspected every year, right, so that we get the paperwork. So, it, you know, it's all this stuff, there is, there's a backlog, but I think with another officer, another fire prevention officer in there, we should be able to, to catch up fairly quickly. Thank you. That's all right. Okay, uh, Council Jarrett. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief Devin. I had a question about overtime. Sure. Um, I noticed, you know, your the overtime line for your department is significantly higher than many other departments. And how do you make the decision about how many um, regular firefighters to hire versus how much you budget in overtime? Um, well, Councilor, I think, so we've always, you know, our minimum staffing is 13, right? So ideally, each of our four shifts would have 16 assigned to it. So you could have a couple of people on vacation and, you know, maybe somebody else sick and it doesn't create that overtime. Uh, once we drop below 13, then we have to hire to backfill to get back to 13. Um, so we don't necessarily... Um, higher I mean what what really affects it too is um, I've got a couple long-term injuries right so those folks are out for a while uh, so if you know sometimes that creates an overtime situation um, I've had you know some of, we got a young department and they're having babies and and taking family medical leave and, and stuff like that uh, so that you know that's a, another you know we've got folks that have to go to trainings and you know, mandatory trainings and stuff like that. So if they're gone for the day and that creates an overtime situation, you know, that's another cost. So, I mean, we, we you know, we do, have, we haven't, you know, since I've been in charge, uh, we, we haven't overspent our overtime budget. Um, we've always been, you know, pretty close, but uh, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we do a good job of managing it. Mm -hmm. You know, we keep an eye on it throughout the year and, 
you know, if we're getting, you know, if we see that the overtime's significant, you know, we'll start kind of dialing back and saying, listen, nobody's going to any training for a while until, you know, we get, uh, we get back on track. So we do keep an eye right. on it and, you know, obviously try not to overspend it. But there's, there's a bunch of factors that, that, in, that uh, work on the overtime side. Right. And at what point would you say we need to hire more regular personnel or, you know, no, you know and because that would be more cost effective than, um, than paying overtime or more uh, easier on the, uh, on the personnel? Right. No, I mean, we've been 13 is kind of that magic number for us. We're able to, uh, to answer all of our calls and, and you know, once in a while, you know, we're calling mutual aid, but it's it's not very often, honestly. Uh, so, you know, 13 works for us. You know, I don't, I don't foresee, you know, unless the, that workload gets ridiculously higher, um, 13 is, you know, 13 on shift has, has worked well for us. So I, I don't foresee hiring and even if, you know, because you almost have to, if you're going to do that, I would have to add one person to each shift, right, to kind of to balance that out. So you're actually, you know, you're hiring four more people. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just don't think that would be cost effective. When you, when you, I don't know, I guess I would defer to Charlene, but hiring four more people mm -hmm. instead of the overtime. <laughs> mom says no, we're not doing that. <laughs> you just call her mom. <laughs> Thank you. Says no, Thank we're not you doing that. that. <laughs> it would have been great if she was like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I knew what the answer was going to be. But. <laughs> Okay. I can recall, Chief, there's always been a problem at the fire department, just like the police department, with the safety on your minimums. And it's nothing new. It happens. You never know when there is a death with a fireman or a firewoman or an illness with a family member and they take a medical leave. Because mm -hmm. I can recall, because I think at one time, wasn't that minimum lower at one time? Wasn't it we 11? Did, yeah, when, when uh, Mayor Higgins was in charge and the budget, I want to say yeah. it was maybe 2003, 2004, when the budget was really bad. Um, really we bad. We got cut to eight. Exactly. We were running with eight, and we couldn't, we were stacking calls, and we were buried. It just it wasn't even, and we weren't running the ambulance back then, so we I couldn't know. even come close to that now. We wouldn't survive. Well, we got a new um, ladder truck coming. Yes, we do. That's a lifesaver yes, right there. Yes, yes. Everybody's very excited, and I'm hoping it'll be here. They're telling me June, July, so it's progressing. I can see it being built. Well, that's progress. Yeah. Should be soon. Uh, Councilor Gore. Um, thanks, Chief, for your presentation. I, I was wondering, you know, you said that you had the busiest year on record last year, and I was wondering why do you think it was so busy, and, and do you anticipate it being even busier next year? Um, actually, yeah, looking at the numbers now, it looks like we're probably, if, if things continue the way they are right now, we'll probably beat the numbers from last year. And I think it's, it's a number of things, right? During the pandemic, you know, people weren't going anywhere, so our call line kind of went down a little bit. Uh, but now that we're, you know, everything's back open and full speed, you know, we're just we're just that much busier. But, you know, people are, you know, a lot of it with the ambulance. Obviously, you know, the ambulance is always 72 to 75 percent of our our call volume. Um, you know, like anywhere else, we have frequent flyers where you know we have folks will transport sometimes a couple times a day. Um, you know, we have a large uh, houseless population in the city that, you know, uh, that takes a lot of our, our call volume. So it's just, you know, I, I guess I can't really pin, pin it on any one thing, um, but it's, it's just getting busier and busier. And it's not just us. It's every department around us. Their uh, call volume's gone up. Um, and I wanted to ask, what's the senior education program? Oh, so the senior For education seniors, program, yeah. uh, well, it's the senior, well, it's kind of like the senior safe program. So every year we get a grant from the Department of Fire Services. It's called the SAFE grant. It's uh, student awareness fire education. But it, so that's when we go into the schools and we have um, educators that are specially trained that go in and they'll do activities with the schools and stuff like that. But on the other side of that, um, we get uh, also money out of that grant to do senior education. 
So we've been doing some um, health clinics and health screenings down at the senior center. And then uh, we started the new home inspection program, which has been hugely mm -hmm. successful. Uh, so our folks are going out and if a resident requests, you know, we'll go out, uh, we install a lock box for them and we'll do a quick home inspection, you know, making sure they're not using you know, uh, extension cords or they don't have you know, a bunch of clutter and stuff around the house, that, like slip, trip and fall hazards and you know, they're not stacking stuff up against their hot water heater or the electrical panel. Uh, you know, just kind of doing an education thing, checking smoke detectors. Uh, not only if they work, but are they current? You know, I mean, some of these houses you go in and the smoke detectors are 20, 30 years old, right? So just kind of, you know, updating that, and that's been amazing. It's been hugely popular mm -hmm. to the point where I had to go back to the mayor and we ran out of money and we still had 30 something people that wanted it done. So uh, we were able to, wow. to uh, get some extra money and, and finish that out. So that's been. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so actually, the council um, allocated more money for that program uh, just in the last few months because mm -hmm. it has been such a right. successful program. So yeah, it's very successful. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to. You've basically covered this. My only question was: I'm interested in from each department about turnover. You know, you said that about paramedics. Mm -hmm. I don't know about your fire. Um, your fire. Um, you know, we haven't uh, we haven't had much turnover lately. I mean, yeah. obviously, a new contract helps. Uh, yeah. And the contract, everybody's very happy. Right. Uh, so, um, yeah, the turnover. We were losing quite a few folks. You know, the last few years, to you know, West West Springfield was a big one. We were losing to uh, some other smaller departments, but uh, I don't foresee any anybody leaving to go to another department right. anytime soon, which is great. Right, so turnover, you know, it's not a stable thing. It's like sometimes there's high turnover and sometimes. Yeah, no, we've been we're pretty stable, which is good. good to yeah. see. And I imagine part of the um, increased um, calls is just our aging population. Yeah. I mean, if you look at our demographic, oh, yeah. real, all of Western Mass yeah, and, and Massachusetts. Old. So, um, <laughs> well, thank you very much. You're welcome. I, Looking for any members, any other counselors or members of the public? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, you could come, come up, up and, yeah, podium. sorry, yes. And just if you could just state your name in um, your city or, or your street. I'm yeah. um, Quaverly Rothenberg. I'm from Northampton. I love what you are doing to help um, with the students getting their certification while they're working. I think that's wonderful. I was just wondering, you made a quick reference to the stream that, or the services that you have to provide to the houseless population. And I was just wondering if you could just elaborate and give a little more detail on what that looks like for the department right now. Um, so, well, so as far as that, I mean, we have, um, they've actually, I guess we up on 5 Franklin Street, Dr. Bossy has started a, uh, she's got a home up there now. It's just, she's taken, I think, half a dozen or so of those folks, which has been great. Um, you know, but we get a lot of them, you know, they just, it's just they get sick or, you know, they're out in the weather, they get sick, they don't feel well, you know, there's addiction problems, and, you know, we get that call and, and transport them. And luckily now, like working with Dr. Bossi and some of these agencies has been great. And, you know, now we're gonna have the new, uh, the new department community care, which will be, hopefully, we're, we're hoping will be uh, cut down on a lot of that and assist these folks with, you know, I think a lot of it is just, you know, finding them a place, a stable place to live, and, you know, making sure that they're taking their medications and they're eating right, right, stuff like that, and, you know, I think that's going to be, that's going to help us out immensely. Are you finding in any direction? No, no, I didn't say no. You're welcome. Okay. I'm noticing I'm not, we're not used to in-person back and forth. Maybe we need to <laughs> think about that so you can face each other better. I see a question or a hand from Gwen Nabad. Can you, let me see, I think I have to unmute you. Okay, you should be unmuted, Gwen. Hello, my name is Gwen and I live in Northampton. I'm a resident here and um, so I have a question in regards to, you mentioned that um, some of the inspections for units that are six or more, um, those are kind of behind. And I'm wondering if you could talk more 
about some of the residences that are six or, or more that would be um, behind. And um, so I, I guess that's my question. Thank you. Sure. I mean, I, I guess I was trying to find um, the problem. I was looking to see how many actually there were in the city um, today. But unfortunately, they're all lumped together with three fam, three plus families. So, you know, I was trying to dig through all that to figure <laughs> out exactly how many there are. Um, some of them we've inspected, uh, but I can't, I guess I can't give you a list of, you know, how many there are in, in the city. Um, but we just, you know, those are inspections that should be done um, jointly with the building inspector's office. Um, but again, we just, we don't have the time to get in there and get those done. So that's one of our objectives this year with that new position is to get those done and catch up on those, on the restaurants and stuff like that. Oh, you get muted? Oh. Hold on, Gwen. Yeah, I think she's muted. I think she got muted again. Where are you? There we are, okay. Okay, uh-oh. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, thank you so much for answering that question. You're welcome. Um, my next question does involve um, a little bit of the houseless population and also um, public housing. I mean, do you see a lot of emergency calls coming to public housing? And um, I mean, I don't have the data, you know, handy off the top of my head, but um, you know, I don't, I guess similar to her question, I don't see it trending in any direction. You know, I mean, there's plenty, we have uh, numerous uh, public housing in the city, um, but I don't think that's uh, it's a huge call volume for us. You know, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't look at it and say, wow, you know, we need to really do something about this. Uh, it's okay. you know, more normal normal business. Okay, thank Nothing you so much. Me. You're welcome. And thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, let's see. It looks like we have one more question from Samsung SM T738U. I'm going to unmute you, and if you could, wait, are you on? You, you look. I think you are unmuted. Hmm. You know like Roy Martin, and it might be Jay. Oh, uh, because I can't. There's no way for me. I don't think they have a. Oh, I don't think you can there. unmute this. Uh, Samsung. Um. um I'm not sure if Roy is. Yeah. Is it, you know it's Roy? Yeah, that's okay. Roy. It, I, yeah. Roy, we can't figure out how to, to get your mic unmuted. Counselor, I think if you want to Joella tab button, it oh. looks, she's gesturing. I think you can oh, get them thank there. You. It's, <laughs> I really feel for you, uh, President Nash. It's hard to see everyone at one time. Let's see. So go to Joella. Okay. Fine. I was telling you. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Joella Jada Tarbud, and this is Roy Martin who's invaded my space and he'd like to ask you a question. <laughs> well, I, I didn't invade your space, she invited me. But <laughs> what, I, what I wanted to know was is these four, four positions, are they already in the budget? Is it already drafted for money in the budget for them four positions? And if so, right? Uh, when they're filled, is that going to mean more money in the budget has to come to the budget, or is that the same for, for this year? Uh, uh, and that was, that was my question. I know uh, I live at the cell blocks. Now, I, we yeah. all the time get into ambulance or firefighters from Northampton uh, Fire Department. Hi, Mr. They're, Martin. How are what, you? Uh, hello? Hi. Yeah. So, um, so there actually are not four positions. Um, you might be responding to something that the chief was talking about, a sort of a hypothetical, but there are not four new firefighter positions in this budget. There is one additional fire prevention officer position. Okay, so there's only one position that's in the budget. Correct. And yet the other three that he was mentioning is not gonna be filled. Correct. I have three uh, vacancies. You might, I might have three vacancies that we're filling. But those are uh, positions already in the budget. Right. Okay. They're already in the budget. Correct. Oh, now next year, are you going to ask for more people or 
Is it going to be what you have? No, I think it should be uh, what we have. Okay, so that's going to keep the budget basically just a few dollars more because of the cost of income. Okay, that kind of answers my question. I, I just wanted to know, and, uh, you know, I've been trying to look at things, and uh, my position is, right, I don't want to go way above the budget and have to go for a prop two and a half override. And, you know, right, I'm hoping that we never have to again. We've had more than anyone else in the state. So uh, let's hope we don't have to go for a prop two and a half override in order to fill in some, some of the money. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Martin. And, and thank you, Jada. <laughs> You're okay? Can we <laughs> safely leave you? Okay. All right, I'm going to mute you. Uh, okay, I don't. Um, does anyone see any other hands? Because I am definitely challenged. Okay. Oh, what'd you say? I have a quick question. Oh, okay, yeah, Councillor. Uh, um, I just have one more question. Sure. Um, where is the fire prevention officer? Like, where is that denoted in the budget? Is it one of the captain positions? Yes, so uh, I believe it's Eric Toya should be listed as the... Oh, okay. So he would be the, yes, so he would be the last captain's position. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Chief Devin. Well, thank you, I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going, but if counselors need a break, just let me know. I'm not, I'm break friendly. So, uh, <laughs> so we have Department of Public Works up with D Director Donna Luscalia next. Good evening, Count Director. Councilor Mayori, oh. if I could speak oh, first. yes. One of those pesky conflicts of interest. So um, as, as a member of the Pebble People Cooperative, I have financial interest in the decisions that are made regarding the Locust Street Transfer Center, which the DPW oversees. So uh, I will recuse myself, but again, I may come in at the end to ask questions that are unrelated to that. So thank you. Yes. Um, and director, before you uh, begin, I just wanted to reiterate that we're gonna do, we're gonna have you present. The counselors will ask qu clarifying questions that, and then the public will make comments and we'll make a list of their questions. And then at the end, we'll come back to you with those questions because often there's themes and so we get, you know, the same kind of question. So that's how, how it's gonna go down. So okay. with that, okay. please, All right. you have the floor. Okay, thank you. It's good to be back in person. It's so I, I, uh, it's, it's been a few years. So yeah. um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak about our operations and our proposed budget. So um, we have several parts to our budget. So I'll just kind of give a high level overview and just sort of hit the, um, the high points of changes for this year. Um, so our general fund is organized into four divisions. We have administration and engineering, highway, which includes streets and fleet maintenance. We have snow and ice, and then we have forestry parks and cemeteries. So our, our responsibilities within the general fund are for the maintenance of the roadways, sidewalks. Uh, we have 38 bridges in town. Maybe the most famous is the Clement Street Bridge, which we've done a lot of work on over the years. Um, do we have all our signal controlled intersections? There's more than 30 of those. Um, do we have all our vehicles and pieces of specialized equipment uh, that we cover through fleet maintenance? We have more than 10,000 public shade trees, all of our athletic fields and parks, four cemeteries, and the bike paths. So it, in putting together this year's budget, just sort of in general, even including the enterprise funds, you know, we needed to uh, balance the need to accommodate PS increases um, due to new collective bargaining agreements and the reality that the cost of goods and services is continuing to rise very, very rapidly. You know, everyone talks about the CPI, 8%, 9%. You know, we're, we're seeing increases that are, are far more than that, double digits, if not triple digits. Um, so, it, you know, it, we're, we're faced not only with those financial challenges, um, but we're also faced with, with actual logistical challenges related to vacant positions. So it's, it's not difficult to look through the budget and see, you know, we have quite a few vacancies. Um, we have uh, 19 vacancies right now out of 90 full-time positions. Um, we also typically have a large contingent of, of seasonal help that helps us in our 
uh, parks and uh, field maintenance, um, and we have uh, sort of casual employees, as we refer to them, who work at the transfer station, and you know we we have uh, difficulty recruiting for those positions. So you know a lot of challenges in putting together this budget. I'm sure I'm not the only department who's talked about this, um, but um, you know requires some level of creativity and and just sort of elasticity of thought as we think about you know how we are spending our money and how we're sort of dividing things up between personnel and money for operations and do we need to uh, backfill with contractors. So, you know, just a couple of items of note within the general fund. We continue to see fluctuations in the cost of gasoline and diesel. Um, you know, so we're running over 80,000 gallons of gasoline in a year, um, over 40,000 gallons in diesel, and you know the price of that varies from year to year. So it, you know we were paying, you know, a couple of years ago we were paying two dollars and seventy-four cents a gallon for diesel. Last year we were paying six dollars a gallon for diesel. So it, you know, and now we're back down closer to three dollars. Um, you know, and and even when we think about things like okay, well, what are we paying for electricity, which are a huge cost for us uh, in the enterprise funds, you know, in our water and wastewater plants. I mean, we've seen the price of electricity, you know, go up by 50%. Um, so it's, it, we're talking big numbers and, you know, there's quite a bit of discipline that we have to engage in just sort of on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that we're balancing the, the needs of the city and those who rely on us for services with the reality of the financial situation, which is that we have fixed costs which are not glorious at all, you know, gasoline and electricity and propane and oil um, that are rising faster than our ability to, to sort of keep up with that. Um, so, it, you know, a couple of, of items in the highway OOM budget. Um, we purchase asphalt by the ton, so I talked about this last year too. Um, and, it, you know, we use this to patch potholes throughout the city. We'll do a thin overlay on a road to sort of hold it together before a more formal reconstruction can be achieved. In 2022, we were paying $60 a ton for that asphalt. Um, and we buy about $200,000 of this a year. So, you know, we're, we're talking thousands of tons of asphalt here. Um, last year, we were paying close to $80 a ton for that asphalt. So, you know, that increase is significant. This year, we're down to $73, but we're still in the, in the course of two years up from $60 to $73. And when you're thinking, okay, 3,000 tons of asphalt, you know, that discrepancy is quite significant. So that sort of cuts into our ability to perform more work. The higher that, that you know, price per ton goes, the less tons we can buy and the less work we can accomplish. Um, I'll also mention uh, line striping. So last year we spent $160,000 uh, restriping the entire city, and, and I think that was met with very positive reviews. Um, so we have seen an increase in, in, in the dollar amount of that line item this year in the OOM budget, um, and that's so we can continue to support those efforts. That's probably you know one of the biggest things we can do um, that's uh, for roadway safety. You know to communicate clearly with you know vehicles and pedestrians and bicyclists what we expect them to be doing in various locations in the road. Um, and I will also note that um, we have, uh, DPW has taken financial control of radio maintenance for the entire city, um, and that comes on the heels of um, a nearly $7 million uh, upgrade um, that we're doing citywide, but th this is a line item that did not used to be in DPW's budget, um, but this is um, something that is now going to reside in DPW's budget. So th there is an increase in the OOM line, but it is because this is new money for something that was already existing, it is just now controlled by DPW. Um, so that's a general fund. Um, for the enterprise funds, you know, I spoke in detail about water and sewer revenue and operations, capital projects during the rate setting process. So, you know, maybe just a, a quick recap on this. You know, we operate and maintain very uh, extensive systems on both the water and sewer side. You know, our water treatment plant is flowing more than three million gallons a day. Our, our sewer treatment plant is treating, you know, about four million gallons a day. Um, you know, we, we have uh, uh, systems that are 
uh, far more complex and, and much larger than many neighboring communities, and we have extensive capital needs, which again I talked about in, in great detail during the rate setting. Uh, process. I also talked about the rising costs, and, and if you remember, we sort of talked about you know, the price of very or various water treatment processes, you know, doubling or even tripling. Um, and and you know, with the uncertainty of Coca-Cola leaving, um, you know, it just puts us in a very difficult financial position. Where we're just finishing up a, a, an 11 million dollar phase one upgrade at the wastewater treatment plant. The project substantially complete. We are out to bid for phase two, which is expected to be about 20 million dollars when those bids come in. Um, the the level of debt service that we have to take on in the sewer enterprise is about to become equivalent to that in the water <coughs> enterprise. Um, and as I've mentioned many times, you know, in the water enterprise, we're running $2 million worth of debt service in a roughly $7 million utility, and we're about to be at that level in sewer, and sewer is a $6 million utility. So the level of debt service that we have in these utilities to fund necessary capital improvements is significant. So this you know, along with the uncertainty of Coca-Cola leaving, and it is unclear who may or may not replace them, you know, required the rate movement that we saw or, and, and that council approved, for which we're grateful. Um, but these budgets are level funded, again, as we talked about during that rate service, rate, uh, rate setting process. Um, so multiple years in a row with a level funded budget here in spite of the rising costs that I talked about. Um, I, I will mention just an update on Coca-Cola. You know, I talked about this a little bit. What we are starting to see is very unstable usage from them. Mm -hmm. So their, their usage was down it, as low as I've seen in March. It rebounded slightly the following month, and now we're seeing it back down again. Um, so, it, you know, it, we're, we're, I, th I think we're starting to get tailings here or at least it looks like that it's very hard to say but i don't think we're in a place where we can be confident that we are going to see historically high levels of usage and revenue from coca-cola um, so we, we obviously needed to make the move that we did um, stormwater and and solid waste so the stormwater budget is level funded there are no notable changes and and that budget has been stable for years um, solid waste, I, I, I will mention, it has been running at a deficit for years, um, it, really since the closure of, of the landfill, which was back in, um, gosh, 2011, 2012 uh, area. Um, what we have tried to do to ensure the long-term sustainability of the transfer station, which we operate to serve city residents, is to try to scale these operations to get to a place where we do not have to pull out of stabilization on an annual basis to balance the budget. We have to produce balanced budgets um, for DOR. So it, you will note that in the solid waste enterprise, we, we are actually pulling from stabilization from retained earnings to balance to balance the budget. Um, what we have tried to do over time is to make that number less. And the way we have done that is by tightening up our operations, by consolidating positions to the extent possible, and just kind of tightening up things so that we can shrink that gap between the revenue we're bringing in and the expenses to just run our operations. We, it's very important to us, very important to the mayor, that we hold our fees stable to the extent possible, and we have tried to do that with you know, the trash bag fees and, and the stickers, um, so that is affordable and convenient for, for residents. You know, we also have the situation where we have a second transfer station in town, you know, Valley Recycling, like most municipalities don't have this level of, um, you know, option, if you will, you know, so, so we do our best to provide good options to folks who may want to use our transfer station um, and, and to provide them with good service. Um, so I'll just finish by, by saying I, I so greatly appreciate the efforts of all of the, the employees at the DPW to, to provide the services that they do every day, just an incredibly dedicated um, group of people. I'm, I'm really honored to stand up here and, and you know talk about the work they do every day. But but they're the ones who who keep our critical services running, and I just think it's important to to recognize their efforts. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions if there are any.
Thank you, Director. Finance Committee members, questions? Yeah. Welcome, Director. <laughs> so, um, so one like a, uh, a timing question, and one like a big picture theoretical one. So first, uh, line striping. I'm one, I, and I love that we have this line striping contract, and they come out like in the dead of night, right? It's like you wake up the next morning and there's stripes. You know, it's like what happened? So there's that's great. I'm wondering if they could do the striping earlier in the year. Um, that that I, I think that my 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 memory of it is that it tends to be later in the season, and I'm just wondering if that's possible. You ever see those? Um those uh it's not like a cartoon it's actually like a meme and it shows the line striping going around um debris in the road or you know just like something in the road and the line striping goes around it in all seriousness the reason that we delay this is because we need time to sweep the streets um it because what will happen is when they come through and paint if we have caked on you know, dirt or, or flood damage or debris that we have not had time to, you know, patrol the streets and remove to the extent possible, you will not have as high a quality job. So that's why we delay it. I, I mean, we try, it, I certainly understand the tension between we want it done now um, and we need time to sweep the streets, but th that's why we do it when we do it. That, thank you for that <laughs> explanation. Okay, and, th and this is a big, picture question because we were to, we talked about this a few years ago with Mayor Narkowitz and, and the, 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 the term everybody was we were using was that we have a hundred million dollars in deferred maintenance on our roadways and then we, we've cut into that quite a bit but I'm, I'm wondering and perhaps you want to go back somewhere and do some calculations but I'm wondering where we are in that are we still because of inflation at $100 million, or where is the, in terms of our deferred maintenance uh, the, on our roads? The easiest way to think about this is in terms of, of lean miles. You know, so, so we have, you know, between 150 and 160 miles of roadway. We, we actually have a, a really great uh, setup on DPW's website, and I'm happy to send the link to everybody. Um, that has a map of the city that shows all the streets which we have paved, that shows um, that what we need to pave and what, what, how we need to pave them. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult. I don't like to throw dollar values around, you know, when, when I'm not certain what that dollar value might be. What I can tell you is that, you know, over the last six to seven years, we have paved 21 plus miles of our 150 plus miles of roadway and these are like major arterial routes right like birds pit road and, and ryan road and 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 um north farms road you know so these sort of mm -hmm. feeder streets in and through the city uh pleasant street is another example palm street palm street roundabout so some some of this we do with mass dot's assistance some of it we do with bonded money or with chapter 90 money um so i think you know i'm i'm i can confidently stand up here and say we have made such progress in, in the amount of work that we have gotten done over the past several years, but you can't take your foot off the gas, you know, pardon the pun, because right now, you know, the roadways are- It just are drives slowly <laughs> yeah, your exactly. foot on the gas. Exactly, but there's actually um, great visuals on our website, and I'd be happy to share that link with everybody so, so that you can send it to, to folks who might be interested. It, it is pretty spectacular, the amount of roadway. It's, it, all of our major connectors are in good condition. And I, I'm just asking, because a lot of that deferred maintenance is it tends to be on secondary streets and dead end streets and those are the those are the streets we get questions about and um, it, right and I think you get questions about them more now because the major arterials yes, are in excellent condition you know six years ago everyone in the city was really struggling with the condition of North Farms Road and Burt's Pit Road and Ryan Road and Pleasant Street and all of these roads that had heavy average daily traffic. And now that 
folks get in their cars and don't even think about it when they drive down this road, they can now sort of pay attention to, well, I've turned onto this side street and it's in terrible condition. And, and there certainly are roads which, which are not in good condition, for, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and the data on our website will back that up. But that has been the shift because we have done so much work um, in, in so many locations. So you're not going to give me the number? <laughs> yeah, I, that's I think, okay. I think, yeah. It's very, I think it's very, very hard to put it that I, I, I appreciate that, but I know you're thinking about it. Thank you. You've answered my question. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Yeah, Councilor Barge, go ahead. Donna, looking at your vacancies, now last year we were at 19, correct? Uh, last year at this time? I, no. I think that's probably a good number. I can't say with 100% certainty it does. Okay. My it does question change. is, I've been counting them, and I'm getting 23, and I had talked with Councillor Nash about it. Are some of these repeats, like a financial administrator, does that go into another department also? It, it, it does. So a couple of things, you know, when, when this budget is published, it is a moment in time. So since this budget was published, there could be people who have either left the employment of the city or come into the employment of the city who are not reflected in here because it's sort of a constant thing. Yeah. So this budget is just sort of a moment in time as, as far as vacancies and staffing go. But yes, we have people whose salaries are paid out of multiple locations. Um, for example, my salary is paid out of four different locations. So if the DPW director was vacant, you would see four different vacancies in here. It's one position, but it's four different, you know, it would show up four different times. So that's, I think, right. the discrepancy. Because I'm looking at, you know, like the drivers on the trucks and so forth like that, but they're different departments. Yes, so I, I think that you're correct. Sometimes you're seeing duplicates. You know, the mechanics, for example, our fleet maintenance mechanics are paid out of uh, a couple of different places. Um, so very, very common in the DPW because we want to accurately reflect the work that people are doing and have them paid out of, out of the proper place. So with 19 positions and Oh, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I was just gonna um, I was just gonna share. If you look under FTE for those positions, you'll see what percent is for which division. Oh, thank you. So you know, so if it's thirty percent, then you you know there's seventy percent divided elsewhere. There we go. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, I have a question. With the nineteen positions that you have right now that need to be filled. Last year we ran into that problem and the year before, but you're not the only DPW. And I think I've talked with you about this with one of my residents on Cardinal Way who's an assistant director and has the same problem. And I haven't talked to her recently, but I am next week in regards, are they filling their, because they had a hard time just like you are. And you have gone up on your salaries, is that correct? We have. We signed new collective bargaining agreements, and, and that definitely bumped the salaries. Um, it, it's just a very... It's just not helping, is it? It's a difficult job. It is. Market. How are... I can't understand how you're operating. Um, the winter time, I mean... <laughs> yeah, you know, we... we um, you have to work with what you're giving. You know, I, I never want to be one who complains or bemoans. Um, we do the best we can with what we have. If I have 19 vacancies, I look at the work that those 19 employees would have been doing. We backfill with overtime. So our, our overtime costs are significant um, because the work still needs to get done. I also backfill with contractors, but that's obviously not um, the most cost-effective scenario in the world um, from an efficiency standpoint. It, it works well, um, but we don't have infinite uh, funds, so you know we can get to a place where um, it, it's uh, you do the best you can with what you have, and and that's the way okay. we're operating. During the winter time for plowing, do you go out and hire private to help out? We do. We have contractors who okay. assist us. Yes, that's a help. <laughs> okay, uh, I see some members. Oh, yes, Council Moulton. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, so uh, 
I wanted to underscore um, one of the things that you talked about earlier, um, and that is uh, solid waste. I noticed, too, that the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund, the operating budget, has, has decreased. And I, I want to say on behalf of, I think, all of our constituents that how much I appreciate the fact that, that you've uh, decreased expenses rather than doing what you perhaps could have done, and that is raise fees for trash disposal, raise fees for stickers, trash bags, which I think I've paid the same price for for many years. So that, that is one way that, um, uh, that you're recognizing uh, that, um, you know, that, that, that there, there are times when the city can reduce expenses rather than constantly raising fees. So thank you for that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to just to, to follow up on Council LaBarge's observation and questions about the vacancies, it seems to me that, <coughs> I mean, the DPW is responsible for maintaining uh, a, a significant amount of infrastructure in the city. And it's not just anymore a question of dollars and cents. It's a question of having the person power to do that. So it seems to me that you're, you're dealing with, um, you know, sort of two major impediments, money and and person power. And that, I, I imagine, I mean, you talked about having to prioritize. I imagine that that leads to to your, you know, having to make some tough decisions at, at some point about what what work can be done this year because of, of those two two factors. That's not really a question, that's, that's an observation, but you might want to co comment on it. it. Yeah, that's true, Counselor. It, the, you know, I, I sort of finished my remarks by saying the employees at the DPW are, are serve the city well, and they take all of us take tremendous pride in in what we do. It is we want to do a good job. We want people to be happy. We we want to you know you want something we want to provide it. Um, it it's very difficult to be in a position where um, that's not always the case and we do the absolute best we can. If this requires, um, like I think any other department in the city and any other department head you talk to will tell you the same thing, you have to be creative to be in this position and it's not about complaining, it's about doing the best you can with what you have, you know, it, you can, mm -hmm. Um, you can sort of always ask for more, but sometimes it's about just using what you have, and, and it, it's more of philosophy. Um, and, and again, we, we want to provide excellent service, and that is always our goal. The reality of the situation is reflected within the budget uh, in, in terms of our constraints. Thank you. Okay, I see some Members of the public, I just had my question's the same. I mean, I, we've been talking about vacancies, I'm thinking about turnover, which is slightly different. Once you get, do you have retention once you do fill a role, or you're seeing a lot of turnover? Um, we do see turnover. Our, um, you know, our competition is is the private sector construction industry. Um, so, you know, we have to think about well, what does the city offer versus what do other employers offer. Um, and, and so, yes, we see uh, turnover and that causes vacancies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, let me see. We're going to go counselors before. Oh, yes. Yeah, and, and the protocol is people are going to ask us the questions right. and yes. then. Chief Davin was so friendly, he started to break our yes. protocol. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. Well, it's we okay. also have a, we have a in person for, you know, where you have, um, you know, in a person, public member talking right next to, so it's a little different. Um, I do see that Councilor Jarrett has a question, and then we'll move on to our, um, to our uh, public members. Yes. Go Great, ahead. thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, sorry, I can't be there in person with you. Um, I have a question about the stormwater and flood control enterprise. Um, you know, there's certainly still interest in taking a fresh look at how that stormwater fee is calculated. And I recall um, that folks, you know, the mayor and others are, are, are interested in looking at that. Is, that. is that something you're continuing to look at? 
Um, yes, we actually, at the mayor's request, engaged uh, the engineering firm Ty and Blonde um, to, to do a thorough review of, of our budgets and the ordinance and, and our uh, billing structure. Um, so their work is ongoing. They do an awful lot of work for um, uh, municipalities um, within Massachusetts, uh, some of whom have stormwater utilities, some of whom are creating stormwater utilities. It's important to remember that the stormwater enterprise was created um, in response to regulation, um, both federal and state regulation. Um, so their, their work um, is looking at, again, all the financial aspects of this, but also the compliance and regulatory piece of this, which is why the stormwater utility exists in the first place. So their work is ongoing, um, and, and we'll certainly let you know uh, as things progress and we have something to report. Great, thank you. Okay, now I see um, James Cope, if you could, um, I'm gonna unmute you, and if you could state your city or and street and we have three minutes go ahead james okay thank you um i live on jewett street in northampton um, and uh, we have been very concerned about the condition of uh, streets and sidewalks uh, in the older parts of that is the older residential parts of northampton um, it's almost impossible uh, to imagine somebody in a wheelchair or pushing a stroller uh, using the sidewalks in our neighborhood. Uh, and we're within two blocks of uh, the high school. So we're not in some remote uh, sort of dead end situation. Um, and I, I recognize the priorities uh, that, you know, the main streets uh, uh, need have needed attention and they certainly did and, and uh, the results are uh, impressive but the overall budget is way too little to deal with the deferred maintenance that was mentioned um, and we're never going to get there we're just never going to see the sidewalks in a condition where they're safe to use on a corner uh, just a couple of houses away, uh, a woman in her 90s uses a walker and she walks in the street. Well, our street is full of potholes. I mean, and they come and, and you know, uh, patch the potholes and then uh, vehicles run over the potholes and, and, you know, I've got a big one right in front of my house right now. Um, the, the street needs to be reconstructed, but um, so do others in our neighborhood. And in, in other neighborhoods, it's just really frustrating. Um, and it reflects generally on the community. Um, you know, it kind of creates a, an appearance of, of blight and, and that uh, the city doesn't care. And I know that's not true, but I'm just saying that's that's the impression I think people would get. I mean, we've gone to other other communities like Shelburne Falls or Williston, Vermont, and we noticed the sidewalks and the streets, and they seem to be in much better repair um, than they are in Northampton. And um, so I I just think there's not going to be a way to to get out of this situation. That roads and sidewalks in neighborhoods are going to just continue to deteriorate. Um, and it gets more and more expensive to, to fix them once they're beyond a kind of a tipping point. Um, and I'm sure the director is well informed about pavement management systems. I guess I, guess I ran over time. That's OK. <laughs> you want to finish your thought? You finished? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so thank you for that, James. I'm going to go to Gwen and then we'll circle back, um, we'll check in with Ch Council Moulton and circle back to the director. So Gwen, let's see. There we go. Gwen, you should be unmuted. 
Yes, thank you so much for taking my question. And I feel like I might be a little bit naive in asking or unknowing in asking these questions, but I do have a few questions about the hiring. <coughs> Um, what is what is the single greatest barrier for hiring people? Is it is it education? Is it the hours? Is it the nature of the work? And then how is the recruiting done? And then how creative can you get with that process of recruiting? So those were some of my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Glenn. I don't see any other hands so let's oh wait I okay J um, Jada are you, are you unmuted hold on there you are now it's we have to keep hitting this thing there we there go. go yeah it's okay. not me oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, the old you want switch. <laughs> okay Roy Mark, one time. Uh, my iPad just isn't picking up yeah. right so uh, Jada let me use hers. And uh, what I was thinking is, now I know there's a shortage on labor, but what if we had something like the honor court was uh, to help out on the labor end, right? And that would help to put a lot of them people into housing and get them a start. I know there's a lot of people that got to start there and a lot of them are doing good now. So, uh, you know, maybe it's something that all the counselors can get together and talk and, and figure out something so to help the homeless uh, to get into housing and to help the situation where they have to have labor to fix the sidewalks and stuff like that. A lot of them are very, very well uh, laborers. So, uh, you know, that's that's something, you know, when Anika was here, Right, Bill Nagel run that good, and people were really happy with it. And I talked about it every time I ran for mayor, but, um, you know, it never went anywhere. But it's up to, it's going to be up to a lot of people to get together and think, we have to have laborers, all right, and they make good laborers. And, you know, they don't take, they don't charge that much. All right, Roman board ain't that much. So anyways. It's going to be up to all of the councils to get together and have a talk about where we're going to get labor so we can get the sidewalks fixed, the roads fixed, and stuff like that. I've been in a lot of roads, and Chickabee's even got better roads than we have. So let's figure out why. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Roy and Jada. Let's right, make sure there's no other questions before we go to Councilor Moulton for the synopsis okay and thank you to Roy for addressing the counselor yes thank you <laughs> okay so all right Council so Moulton, if you want to, I will uh, recap down again yes I will shop. recap the questions I think um, I think a couple of them are pro probably mayoral level uh, and that would be uh, the priority for more money uh, to get uh, to uh, address the uh, question of deferred maintenance on roads and sidewalks and the possibility of bringing back a an honor court like uh, group to uh, help um, uh, address the shortage of of, uh, of of labor in the in the Department of Public Works and then I think for uh, for Director uh, Lascaglia would be the question of what is uh, the recruitment process and what's the single uh, greatest barrier to hiring in your department? Sure, uh, do you want to? Uh, yeah, so the, the minimum entry requirements for to work I in DPW as a truck driver labor and equipment operator is you have to have a commercial driver's license. Um, and, and that is probably our, our biggest challenge. Um, you know, commercial, Drivers uh, have a lot of employment options uh, these days. You know, if you're driving down the interstate, you see a 53-foot trailer in front of you, and it says, you know, there's an advertisement on it, and it says, you know, make x x dollars, you know, per mile in your home every night, and you know, some of them even go so far as to say you can make, you know, eighty thousand dollars a year or or whatever. It's a highly competitive market. It is a difficult license to get. 
Um, there's drug screenings associated with it. Um, so these are professional drivers. We have heavy equipment. Um, we're covered under federal motor carrier rules. Um, you have to be able to drive a CDL vehicle in order to work for us. Um, if we're talking about working at the water and wastewater plants, uh, the Commonwealth has very strict licensing requirements. We have to have licensed wastewater operators. We have to have licensed drinking water operators. Those are um, very lengthy apprenticeship processes that, that can stretch for years and have an education and practical experience component to them. Um, so, so this is not a scenario where um, you, you just sort of hire someone and, and throw them behind the wheel of a truck and away they go. Um, is, so the, the recruitment that we do, um, you know, we are, we are looking for professionals and, and that's, it, it, at the end of the day, that's what the department is comprised of. These, these are folks who have a lot of licenses and a lot of practical experience in their pocket. Um, and so it, it's just a, a hyper competitive market. So, you know, our recruitment is, you know, we're on Indeed, um, we're on the city's website, we've done job fairs. Um, you know, a, again, it's a difficult market, um, but you have to have a commercial driver's license, and there are rules and regulations, including drug screenings uh, associated with that. And those are just the rules that we have to abide by. So, you know, the private sector is uh, a, a very, um, they, they pay very well. Um, and, you know, that is our competition. I think, was that the question for me? I just wanted to That was. Sure Thank you for that. Covered everything. Yes. Um, so, the honor court, it's brought up sometimes, uh, mostly by Mr. Martin. Um, and uh, it, it's not something that's in active any longer. I think there are um, there are reasons for that. There are reasons why it was it's no that sort of labor is no longer used. Um, it's not saying that I'm really uh, you know I think there are good reasons why, and um, it's not saying that I'm really particularly comfortable with uh, anyway. Um, so I don't believe that that will be coming back anytime soon, and that's um, that we should sort of force people into labor in that way. Um, in terms of devoting more money, we so we uh, borrow $1.5 million um, annually for, for paving, um, and that is, you know, that's something that we've built into our budget. It's a significant amount to borrow. Um, we, you know, we are always trying to figure out what is the, the right amount to be able to accomplish um, also within uh, that sort of limited construction um, season window. Um, and you know, there's there's various tensions when you're when you are doing paving or doing um, sidewalk work. So it there is disruption involved with it as well. Um, but we do you know I think as Director Oskali has said we do try and and um, chip away at it every year and and keep up, um, but also advance uh, some of the the maintenance that we know needs to happen. Um, and I believe we have doubled, in the last couple of years, we have doubled the amount of money that we are putting towards sidewalk repair. Um, that too has, there is tension there between um, some of our, um, some of our priorities. So, um, but involving trees, that can also be a challenge with, with repairing sidewalks. So we're always trying to find that balance and, and advance it as much as possible. But I, you know, I join everyone in, in feeling that I wish we could um, have all of our sidewalks maintained in a way that that felt like people could pass um, as freely as possible on them, and, and we are we're working on getting as much done as we can with it. Okay, anything else there? And just to add to that, um, Director, isn't it your sense that climate change is actually you know Im impacting the scheduling of that? Meaning, you know, things don't stay paved as long as they used to. Yeah, I think there's no question that we yeah. deal with, you know, adverse weather conditions uh, of greater intensity and frequency than yeah. ever. Um, it, you know, it, it is absolutely a factor. We, we sort of fought it all winter long. You know, we used to get yeah. snowstorms, now we get ice storms, um, uh, you know, which are even harder to deal with than snow in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. So, um, you know, there, it, it, it definitely, um, you know, makes things harder. Just, just to kind of expand on the sidewalk conversation, just very briefly, what the mayor said, you know, and she talks about sort of the tension that we have with sidewalks, you know, 
the vast majority of the sidewalk damage we see around the city is actually caused by conflicts with trees, tree root upheaval, trees in the way. You know, a lot of times sidewalks were installed that just were not compliant in any way. It was sort of just a strip of asphalt that got laid down back in the day that people could pass on. You know, when we come through and install a sidewalk, there are design standards that we have to meet. We can't just go through and make a sidewalk that's you know two and a half feet wide and, and sort of ignore those design standards. We have to come through and we have to make an ADA accessible sidewalk. Mathematically, sometimes that is not possible without disruption to people's property, uh, public shade trees, which may be in the way, other utilities, which may be in the way, just sort of you know things that are there. So this, this becomes a little bit of a, a math puzzle for us. Um, a lot of folks don't realize the city's right of way actually stretches into their yard. You know, so if we come through and have to put in a, a, a 48 inch or 60 inch sidewalk, you know, we could be encroaching in places that we have not previously been, and there could be um, a tree that is there, um, which is in conflict with the sidewalk. Um, and this is the reality of the work that we do all throughout the city. So we do the best we can to, to kind of balance all these priorities, but it is not as simple as we're just gonna go fix this sidewalk. It's, it's, there, there are often significant challenges associated with just doing a stretch of sidewalk, you know, the length of, of this room. Thank you. Donna, we're talking about sidewalks. My favorite, Florence Heights coming down the hill, which definitely is not ADA in compliance, which you know, and it's very difficult with children, elderly, whoever, to even access on that sidewalk. And I know when we had done a site visit, with the ADA coordinator and pictures were taken and Consulate Jarrett and I were there. And I have a problem, Donna, and you know I do, because it's been years and years and years. Nothing has been done for the safety of anybody using that sidewalk. So I just heard you say something to the effect that well, there's a lot involved. Yes, there will be a lot involved because you're looking at some really bad curbs coming down on that Florence Heights Hill. And also, moving, you're gonna have to move property, there's no question about it, in order to redo that sidewalk for ADA compliance. I mean, even the curbing is not even ADA. We have no curb cuts, we have nothing there for wheelchairs. That's a, that's, a, that's a great example of all of the challenges that we right. just talked about. It that, is. that actual location is a great example of, of every one of the things that we just covered that make exactly. sidewalk work challenging. Thank okay, you. counselors, uh, public, I don't see anything. Um, thank you, director, you've given me something to think about at two o'clock in the morning. That's <laughs> great, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> And really thank you for your time tonight and gl glad to see you in person. Um, Could we have a brief recess yes, before the next on. presentation? Okay. Yes, we have. So we, we have one more department, the Department of Health and Human Services. Let's maybe get back here by um, 745. Oh, we're having a break. Wow. Yes. <laughs> I know. I was tempted to plow through, but I think.
I thought they usually had it earlier in the morning, Rachel. Yeah. Okay. Five, four, okay. Is that something new? One. Okay, so we're back at the uh, budget hearing. We have um, one more department to go. We've mm -hmm. got the Health and Human Services Department with Health Commissioner Meredith O'Leary. Again, for members of the public, we're gonna hear a presentation um, from the commissioner. Uh, counselors on the Finance Committee will ask clarifying questions. Other counselors can ask questions, and then we'll go to the public who can direct questions to to the um, Finance Committee, and then we'll circle back again to the Commissioner. So let's get the, let's see. Um, there we are, okay. So, uh, Commissioner O'Leary, welcome, good evening. I think you're unmuted. Yes. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you for thank you. joining us. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, um, but thank you for allowing me to remote in, and good evening, counselors, mayors, and members of the public. So tonight I am presenting, um, I think for the first time, as no, actually this is my second year as the Department of Health and Human Services, so I'm super excited about that. Um, as you all can see that we have a very slight increase to our budget um, this year primarily because we are unsure of some grant funding through the um, through one of our grants called EAPS, which is Equitable Approaches to Public Safety. Um, however, with that being said, you'll also notice on our budget this year that we have a decrease in our PNS line items because we have two positions that were merged into um, one position and then also I have a slight increase in how much my current grants are supporting our PNS. And then there was a small increase in our O&M and again that was due to um, the uncertainty of a certain grant fund um, that we need to have a, co a contract for our facilities for the DCC. Um, our vacancies, when this budget was submitted at, uh, about three months ago, we had eight vacancies of our 23 staff. I know it says 22 under budget FY24, but I recounted and, I, and it's 23 on the bottom. Uh, of those eight vacancies, we filled a few. We have filled the DCC coordinator's position with um, Natalia Birch is her name, and we have also filled the Administrative Assistant Grants Manager position with uh, Cara Iacoponi is her name. Currently, we have four Community Responder positions open. We just started interviewing this week to fill those positions, and we have a few good candidates that we're very excited about. So we're hoping to have those positions filled um, and have them start their onboarding process June 20th. The other vacancies that we have currently is one is a regional public health nursing position. This has been vacant and we've been posting for four months now. We're really struggling with getting um, candidates to apply for this position. And then our last vacancy is the regional database manager position. And right now we're just putting that on hold. Um, because this is a fully grant funded position and we don't have the grant funding to support that, that vacancy right now. So if we get the, a couple of the grants that we just recently applied for, then we'll fill that position. Um, in terms of grant funding this year, I'm happy to report that we've taken in uh, $2.6 million in grants and a variety of grants um, from very large grants uh, for that that support our prevention work, and to the EATS grants, to Public Health Excellence, which is regional grant. Um, so there's a lot of money coming in. For those of you that might not know, um, or just might need a refresher, the Department of Health and Human Services has six divisions within it. We have the Division of Public Health Nursing, we have the Division of Inspectional Services, Division of Emergency Preparedness and Response, Division of Substance Use Prevention, we have the Division of Pu Public Health Excellence, and the Division of Community Care. And that makes up uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. 
So a few other highlights just to take this opportunity to, to note here, in addition to the grants, we also have um, two approved IRBs this year. We have a research IRB with UMass to evaluate the and document the DCC. And then we also have a data equity um, IRB, which is going on our matrix data, which is uh, for our um, research on opioid overdose fatalities. We've also become an approved affiliate of uh, Mass Department of Public Health to be a uh, state affiliate of the Naloxone Purchasing Program, which means now that we get all our, our Narcan for free. And this past year, we have documented that we have given out over 1,800 kits of Narcan to date. Another big notable um, highlight of this year is we expanded our, uh, we expanded our, dope, our DART program, excuse me, from 24 communities to 45 communities that are now, now using our DART model. So with that being said, I think I will um, open it up to you to see if you have any questions of me on the budget. Okay, thank you. Um, finance committee members, questions for the commissioner. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, yes, Officer Moulton. Uh, yes, thanks, thanks, uh, Commissioner. Um, I had a question about the, uh, uh, the data analysis that uh, I know has uh, at least started and perhaps uh, has now been finished of the three years of dispatch data that you're looking at in, in the connection with the Division of Community Care and determining the kinds of calls that DCC may respond to. Is that analysis done and have you um, drawn any conclusions from it yet? So yes, we have received the report from um, the consultant, which is LEAP, and what we're doing is kind of doing a deeper dive into the report. The types of data that they, they the overarching type of data that they've been giving us is they've been assessing the volumes of calls, the origins of calls, the types of calls, um, calls that resulted in police involvement, post-crisis uh, post follow-up, types of services and ports offered. So there are all types of categories um, that, that we are really kind of doing a deeper dive into, and then we're meeting with um, Northampton PD and Police Chief Davin to really uh, suss that out even further. So the re we have the report, but it just needs, we, we just need it to be a little more granular. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I see Jada, I just wanted to uh, follow up a little bit with that um, before we go to the public. Um, so with the, the outreach workers, what, what is your time frame for that in terms of when you think they'll be up and ready to answer <laughs> calls? And I, I know that you're still determining what sure. type, type. Would you say? No, I said sure, absolutely. So um, again, we are interviewing. It's our hope to have at least some of the community responders, if not all of them. We're in the process of uh, hiring four to start on June 20th, um, which they'll have two days of orientation in-house, and then they'll have a rigorous uh, 150 hours of training between uh, the end of June and the end of August. Uh, we begin or plan on responding to calls through the DCC <coughs> phone line, email, or text starting September 1st. Okay, so by the fall, we'll be, um, you'll, we'll have, uh, you know, an alternate place for calls to go. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Let's see, Councillor Gore. Um, thanks, Commissioner. Um, I just had a question about the DCC budget. Um, I see lines in here for the personnel for the peer outreach worker and the DCC director and the DCC coordinator, but what other um, budget line items are for the DCC? So in my O&M, it's not broken down by division. It's just all one lump sum. And my O&M is, uh, I think it's about 166,000, 
dollars, if that's correct. Um, much of the contractual services will be used for the DCC. We have, um, you know, we have to, we still have to purchase um, technology, we have technology needs, computers, software programs, some furniture and supplies, some retrofitting to the vehicles. We bought vehicles with the grant that we have this year, um, but we'll need to retrofit them for our needs. Um, uniforms, medical, medical gear. Um, so there's a lot of needs that are going to be that are going to fall under contractual services because of the threshold when you need a contract over a certain amount. But my O and M is not again divided up by divisions. Commissioner, could you also um, go through some of the some of the positions that um, also will assist the DCC? So you have. Um, there, there are the outreach and, and the ones that are marked as DCC, but they're one of the beauties of bringing DCC into Health and Human Services is that um, some of the other support positions also will you know, assist with it. So absolutely. So um, if I can just bring in um, a component of the DCC that I'm not sure everybody is aware of, that we are, we will have a public-facing DCC community space that's being designed um, using a trauma-informed lens. Um, as community members may enter the space while we'll experience a crisis, we want to create a space that will that will help with any de-escalation process that may need to occur. Um, so this space, we intend on having our other DHHS staff either do drop-in services there. So we have um, substance use prevention specialists on our on our staff. We have primary prevention specialists on our staff. And we also have public health nurses on our staff. So it's our intention to actually have a public health nurse in this space while it's in operation. Um, the community space in its beginning, in this first phase of the rollout, will be open, I believe, from 8.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. So um, our DHA staff will be in that space in addition to the DCC uh, coordinator. Right behind, um, and if I didn't mention, this is in one roundhouse plaza. It used to be the, Smith the Smithsonian Chowder House. That's where this public um, face and community space is going to be. And behind that, we have a space where we're going to house the administrative staff of the DCC. Does that kind of answer what you were looking for, Mayor? Yes, I think so. I just wanted to make sure that uh, it was clear that um, there, there are additional staff that also serve the DCC, even though Absolutely. it doesn't have DCC next to their uh, titles. Yeah. So much of the work that is done in all of my divisions intersects. So we will be assessing um, with the DCC community responders because part of the onboarding process is they will have face time with each one of my division uh, staff, lead and staff to really kind of learn what it is that that division does and we can talk about where the work will intersect and how we can support each other and how we can work together. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. I see, any other counselors? I, I just oh. want to make note no. that Councillor Perry sent me a text saying he had to sign off and Oh, yes, okay. His work obligations. Okay, that's good to know, just so I won't I feel like I'm not seeing him. All right, great. So um, let's see. Oh, so um, Jada, let me I'm unmute so you. Sorry, Jada. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, Chris, hold on just a sec there. Uh, Councillor Jarrett. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I'm, I'm very excited to hear that. Uh, the DCC will be up and operational in a few months. Uh, it's been a, a long time, um, and I know you've been, you all have been working so hard on it. Um, I did want to ask about one aspect you know, that the Northampton Policing Review Commission had that um, we, you know, we gave you a very tough charge here, I think, and, um, and I'll read a little from the commission's report. Uh, you know, the department needs to be accountable to those that it serves in a way that is not currently seen in city departments or by social service agencies who contract with the city or state. The leadership and governance of the department should include people with lived experience of criminalization and marginalization and those impacted by it. Uh, and those people should be prioritized in hiring decisions at all levels. Um, 
but there's more, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, so I guess the question is, you know, th that's a very tough charge given the limitations of municipal procurement and, and all of the rules that we have to abide by. And I'm curious if you've been able to incorporate any of those principles uh, into um, the leadership, the, the functioning um, of, of the DCC. Sure, no, absolutely. So the DCC, as we see it, it's a public, it's a public health-led additional resource to the city of Northampton's public safety system, where it really focuses on, on addressing racial and social inequities and supporting our community members during times of significant challenges related to emotional distress, substance use, homelessness, so on, um, serving our, our marginalized communities. Um, it was very, very important to us when we were thinking about our community responders and who is on the DCC team, um, it was important to us to really look at the language that we used and make sure that we were inclusive and, um, and very thoughtful and tactful on how we were going to recruit people that were going to serve this population because we really want people um, who have had experiences um, and we call that lived or living experiences because that is so important when uh, to bring to the table when you're working with people that are are experiencing certain or similar types of situations. So again, it's about the job description. We looked at national models um, across the country. We have taken and there's no best practices. I'm not going to use the word that we're taking best practices from these national models because this is all very much new, but we're taking what we've learned, the, t the best of what we've learned from all of these models and integrating it into um, our, our choices of words and um, how we promote and where we are, where we are um, marketing or putting our job descriptions out to. So we are really looking at that report and integrating to the best of our ability while also thinking about risk management and a whole bunch of other things um, to roll out the, the best program that we can. Great, thank you. And, and in terms of feedback from the community, feedback from those who have been most impacted, uh, how will you take that feedback and, and work that into the program as you go forward? That's wonderful. So we um, we consulted with a company called C4 Innovations, who did key informant interviews, um, both with the people um, of the population that we plan to serve, um, agencies that do serve them, and they have put together this very lovely report for us of what the concerns on, how they'd like to be served. When I think about measuring our success in a year from now, I would like those key informant interviews to happen again and look at what differences there may be from year one of the interviews being had before the launch and year after a year's launch. So we are, we're listening to the community, we're listening to the businesses, we're listening to the people impacted by mental health crises. So that's where we're getting our information from are these sessions. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, counselor. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, I do this all the time. <laughs> Firstly, I wanted to say, uh, 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 was Councilman uh, uh, Alex Jarrett? I really appreciated your question because I was going to ask uh, along those same lines. So I'm glad that people are thinking about this. Um, and I, I guess what I'm going to ask um, is, uh, is that Chairperson Meredith O'Leary, I guess, could apply to the other person who was talking about, you know, these job, you know, job positions are available and, you know, because where I, I see, I know people who are qualified, who look like me, who would like to come and work. So I'm asking you, do you target non-traditional job listing network websites um, to get people? And if you do, and then if you do, good. And then I have to ask, in your uh, agency, do you practice, for example, diversity, equity, and inclusion training? Um, because that's also, that's where I've learned the most what people are looking looking at too. So I'm just wondering, because I see a lot of people who need jobs, uh, who would want jobs. Um, you know, maybe there's something, you know, maybe to Northampton, 
you know, there's always an attractive factor about coming here. So my question is, how do you seek out um, diverse groups of people? I don't like word marginalized because I don't know what that. I'm not put to a margin. I mean, I don't. I don't use it myself, but I do understand it. But I just want to ask you, how do you? I guess how do you? How do other people who are spoken and um, maybe the city council could um, think about that too. How do we go about, seriously? Um, I mean, I could just think of some websites, Black Career Network, Black Jobs, Diversity Jobs, Hispanic Latina Professional Association, Norfi, I mean, that's just off the top of my head. I, I'm sure there are even more. So I'm just curious, uh, the commitment to doing that and how you go about it. Thank you, those are great questions. Um, so HR has a, uh, a a certain set of places where they do indeed post the positions and we've been working with them very, very closely on different avenues so we can attract um, a more diverse uh, pool of applicants. And so we, um, over the past, uh, we've, been, we've had so many job openings lately that this is something that we've been growing where we're putting these postings. Um, we're welcome. I would love that list that you just rattled off very quickly, so I'll have to go back um, to this recorded, this recorded meeting and get that. But no, we've worked with Casa Latina. We have worked with a lot of our partnering agencies um, that um, work with diverse populations. We, we try to get these job postings as far and wide of a reach as we can. Um, but again, it, it's definitely a new learning curve for us. So again, HR is kind of in charge of that, but we're we're working together to to, to get these these just job descriptions, these posting out as as best we can. Um, secondly, we also changed the language. We spent a lot of time on the language that we chose to be more inclusive. Um, sometimes words can be off-putting or could make someone feel intimidated or make them feel that they're not qualified. So we're really, really working with the professionals and a DEI consultant on the language that we choose to include in these job descriptions. So that's to answer your first question. And then now to your DEI question. Um, yes, indeed, we are doing diversity, equity, and inclusion training. And we're doing it for our, DE, uh, for our DHH staff um, that's part of our professional development, but we're also doing it on a um, citywide. Um, the mayor would like um, all of their, uh, all of the city employees to have this uh, foundation um, interrupting racism, one and two, structural racism, um, for all of their employees to be trained in that in the first year, and then we can grow from there. So I hope that answered your question. Okay, thank, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for that, the question, Jada. Um, let's see, I think we have Gwen. Okay, Gwen, you're on. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, okay, so I do have a few questions. Um, <clears throat> so one, one question I have is, is something about research equity and I was wondering in this data analysis um, that you were speaking of, if that includes rates of asthma, cancer rates, health issues, and rates of cognitive and developmental disabilities in children who live in low-income housing, if that could ever be a part of that um, in this region. And then I'm also interested, I don't know if, if people would have access to the results of the focus groups that happened for the DCC, and then the other thing is, at the end of um, Mayor Narkowitz's, um service, just near the end of that, he decided to start charging for final Board of Health reports. Um, so now um, what's happened is um, I'm wondering if that cost can be removed for people, for low-income citizens or elderly citizens that live in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. All right, um, let me just see if there's any other hands before we count, uh, check in with Councilor Moulton. Make sure we got the questions. I don't see any. 
Um, any anyone in person? <laughs> yeah. Please do. Yes, please do. <laughs> uh, could you just state your, you know, something about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> your favorite color, I like your road. color blue. <laughs> uh, okay. Javier Luengo Garrido. I live in 27 Northern Avenue, the street with the craters. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so the question goes uh, hand to hand with what uh, Councilor Jerry was asking uh, Commissioner O'Leary in relationship to, so one of me and Consul Jared serve in the same subcommittee and th also we serve as a full body commissioners of the Northampton Pollution Review Commission. The, the accountability piece is always complicated, right? In, in creating a feedback, a loop feedback for people actually receiving the, the services for them to feel that if I complain, if I report, the service is not going to be taken away. There is not going to be retribution. It's really hard, and you know, we always talk about Northampton not because of the numbers in Northampton. It's really easy to deconstruct who is giving that testimony, who is reporting that situation. We don't have 500 people being served. We don't have a thousand people being served. So, um, having in mind that. Uh, have you uh, thought about how the, the, the feedback coming from affected communities, from community members getting the services of the DCC, how that's going to be treated in the sort of the safeguards of privacy are going to be treated? Right. Okay. Th thank you, ha Javier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I, we're going to go to Councilor Moulton, who just was writing down some notes to give the commissioner. Um, Okay, so I, I'm going to take uh, the last uh, first, uh, and then I'll go back to um, to the questions that, that Gwen posed. Um, uh, what Javier is asking is uh, how feedback taken from people uh, who are served by DCC will be safeguarded in terms of their privacy, so there won't be retribution. Mm -hmm. Certainly. So, um, so having been the, uh, the, the health director for 10 years and now health commissioner for the last one year, um, I am all about making sure that health medical records um, are, are, we're following HIPAA compliant laws, even though some of what we do doesn't necessarily need to be HIPAA compliant. That is the gold standard of a health department. And so whenever I've given any type of data reports, it's usually aggregate data that you'll get from us. It's never super granular, granular and it's never identifiable. Um, you might, I, I, I made sure of that in COVID, I made sure that, you know, that just in our standards of practice. And um, we have HIPAA compliant officers within our team, myself being one of them, and then our medical staff is very um, astute of our HIPAA and privacy rules. So we as a DHHS have um, policies and guidelines for all of our staff members and that is uh, probably number one or maybe number two on our policy list to make sure that everybody understands the importance of, of privacy and HIPAA. So, so I, I would follow up by, by also saying that I mean, part of that is communicating to people who are being served who may be fearful that that safeguarding is taking place. So there's an educational component to that as well. Absolutely. Correct? Correct. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to do my best to capture. Um, Gwen had two different questions, I believe. One is related to. Uh, analyzing the impacts of low-income housing on, on certain health outcomes, including asthma and cancer, and, and, and whether that data is, is available? So um, there is a community, it's called the Chinook Community Health Needs Assessment that's done every three years by the hospital that gives county-wide data that speaks to that. Um, so that is available online at Felita 
and website on the Cooley Dickinson Hospital website now Mass General. Um, but we are also going to be conducting a community um, health assessment just that is Northampton proper, um, just the city of Northampton. Um, so we will have that type of data readily and available for our community. But it, it, there is data on the countywide level. So can, can you uh, talk a little bit about how the current data is available to people and how the, the, the data that you'll be collecting will be made available to people? Well, sure. Data is super important because it helps drive the work plan. So every sing, you know, every year we, or every year that the Chana comes out, we look at the data and we look where, you know, how are people getting sick? Why are people getting sick? And us as a public health department of health and human services, we like to work on prevention so people don't get sick. So we look at environmental health factors that might be contributing to an increased cancer rate and. Um, a, you know, maybe a, a certain section of people who live in Northampton. So that's the kind of data that we look at to help write our work plans. Um, so again, this being countywide, we want something a little more um, uh, Northampton centric that we can write a specific write, uh, a specific work plan or strategic plan for the city of Northampton. So that's not available yet. That is in our work plan this year to do a Northampton community health needs assessment, but we used the Cooley Dickinson one in the past to drive our, our work plans. Okay, thanks. And then the other question that Gwen had has to do with uh, a charge for final Board of Health reports and whether that can be removed for um, for for, uh, for low income or, or elderly uh, residents. So I don't know what that is. Uh, nor I'm do not I. Familiar with that? Nope. Mayor. I am also not familiar with that. Sorry. to unmute Gwen. Yeah, I, just want, I don't know why. Okay. Oh, oh hi. Oh, Gwen, sure. we were looking so, for a clarification on your question. Sure. About the so cost. Near, the end, yeah. near the end of Mayor Narkowitz's um, uh, service to the city, um, there was a meeting, I forget which one, it was a while ago, um, and what he decided to do was to start charging for final Board of Health reports. In other words, if there was a situation where the Board of Health came in and they, they, they made an assessment, and then the final results of those reports um, apparently have to be paid for rather than, um, you know, just provided um, the final reports. Those cost money, which means that People have to like go downtown or whatever they have to do. Um, it just seemed a little inaccessible to me. So that's kind of what I was wondering. And also like just the cost. I know it might not be very much, but I just, you know, it might be 10 cents a sheet, but I just feel strongly that, um, you know, that should be something that, it's kind of part of state law anyway, that there is supposed to be a final report that's provided, but um, I think that was a change that, that was made during Mayor Narkowitz's time, that people now would have to pay for these final reports. Are you talking about a records request? Just the final, you know, report. You know, like if someone makes a, a report to the Board of Health uh, and then well, the Board of Health comes in and assesses the conditions, that final report, I, was, I have been told that I have to pay for it in order to get it. Um, so I'm wondering why. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm not sure what you're referencing. We don't charge for our reports. If we go in and do an inspection of your um, unit and we have a written inspection report, we provide you a copy right there. We don't charge for that. Okay, and then the results after the work is complete. Yeah, I, we don't charge for any. Okay. That's I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I wish I knew knew exactly what it was that you're referencing, but we don't charge. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, thanks. I'm just going to check with any follow-up comments from the public or counselors, questions. I'm not seeing any. Wait, is there one? Somebody. Oh, yep. Hold on. Come on. Okay. Oh. Jada. Jada. Hi, it's Hi. me again. Hello. Hi. Um, I was very intrigued with the commissioner, where'd she go, O'Leary, uh, with this, oh, hi, uh, with the, uh, I don't know, was it a data-driven questionnaire? Because I've been back in Northampton a decade, and I've never seen it, and I love to give my opinion, so I have never had it, and I don't think I've ever met anyone here in public housing who had that. Roy Martin is the mayor of public housing, Savo, maybe not the city, but mayor of Savo. So, and he had just mentioned that he's never seen it. So when do you put it out and do you have it in a language other than English? And, uh, and is it irregular? Is it every five years? I mean, when I was in Holyoke, they did, it was a comprehensive health assessment and it was a hospital, uh, food, uh, pantry, um, social services. So it was amazing and we could do it online. And it was different, but I have never uh, had. As a matter of fact, I would love for something like that to happen. I would love for us to really see what's going on with all populations. Um, so I'm just curious with that. And I have to ask. This is to the mayor. So I just want to make sure I get this correctly. Are you saying all city agencies are required DEI training? And if so. I hope it's not just one day a year, certain type of month. I mean, how often is that? And where's the training and who? Because I live in Northampton, they have lots of them free all the time. I do it on the regular, once, twice a month. And uh, I can't say, oh, I've already done that training. It's ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. So I'm just curious because I think that would help a whole lot of many. I'm curious too. Roy says he's curious too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So I, hi. Um, so working with the DCC and working with Commissioner O'Leary, we um, contracted with Human in Common, who um, has been running trainings for um, city leadership positions and city staff. And so I think we've had, Meredith, remind me how many people have taken the training. It is a two day, tra two full day training. So there's the first, um, the first day and then uh, the next month you take the second day so it's two full in-depth days of training that I have asked all department heads to take and for them to identify key staff who are um, particularly people who are public facing to, um, to to take that training. Mayor we have almost 200 who have completed the training. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you to our commenters. Um, it's really interesting stuff. I'm just taking a look. I think we're wrapping up the Department of Health and Human Services. One more look. Anyone see anybody? Okay. Well, thank you. It's been very dynamic. Thank you, Commissioner, for joining us. And thank you all. Have a wonderful night. Yeah, you too. Thank you. So now I think procedurally we want to recess finance right. and then recess full city council. Does that sound right, Laura? The old, but do we need to vote to continue the hearing? Do we? Either close or continue, but we to right, we have continue to, close to the continue. tomorrow. Oh, to, okay. okay. I'll make a motion to continue the hearing to tomorrow night at 6 p.m here in City Council Chambers and on Zoom. I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> Roll call, please, Laura. Take your time. Um, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay, so with the, the, yeah, as, as <laughs> the President said, we will continue tomorrow at 6. And now I guess we're back into? Now we're back in full council, and I guess we need to vote to continue the council meeting till tomorrow as well, right? Yes. Well, not, it's not a public hearing, so you don't, um, huh. So we just you, reset? You can just adjourn. And we are going to, I'll just say, we're going to adjourn till tomorrow at well, 6 o'clock? 
Well, why don't I move to adjourn? Okay. Just All right. Second. Counts motion made by Councillor Mayori, seconded by Councillor Foster. There's no discussion on adjournment. Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry is not with us. He left the building. No, okay. Well, this is left. <laughs> okay, we are adjourned. We are. So. Thank it's confusing you. having two people running the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I might, we might Good night, everyone. Have to vote to adjourn. I don't know. <laughs> I'm